And without further ado, I would like to introduce Jim Laurie to introduce the Homeschool Symbiosis team for their third appearance at our conferences. So, so how's this microphone working? So I got to lean down. No, stay further away from me. I got to lean down. Really? No. Up, up. Okay. Is that okay? What, what about what about those microphones? Are they working? They're working. Yeah, okay. they're working. Okay, good. Okay, this is actually their fourth uh, presentation, and uh, this is the third one here at Harvard. And um, these kids are going to college next year, most of them anyway. We hope so. But I'm going to let you. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you who they are. So. So uh, I want to welcome the uh, Homeschool Symbiosis team. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are the Symbiosis team, as Jim said. We're very, very excited to be here for our fourth conference. Um, and today, we're going to take you on a little walk through different ecosystems. Um, and so, so show you how each of them can lead to an Earth Restored. So my path to an Earth Restored leads through the forest. As Michael Pollan says in an article for The New Yorker, plants dominate every terrestrial environment, composing 99% of the biomass on Earth. Forests cover 31% of the Earth's surface. Trees have existed a lot longer than humans, so they've got some stuff figured out. One of the first things trees can teach us is to look at time through their eyes. A, a tree's time frame is much slower and much, much longer. To quote Michael Pollan again, the lives of plants unfold in what amounts to a much slower dimension of time. I first became interested in forests after hearing about research done by Suzanne Samard in the forests of British Columbia. She conducted research by covering seedlings of paper birch and Douglas fir with plastic bags and then injecting carbon-14 dioxide gas into some bags and carbon-13 dioxide gas into others. She discovered that the seedlings sucked up the CO2 through photosynthesis, turned it into sugars, and then sent it to their roots to be shared with their neighbors of different species. In Samard's words, they were having a lively two-way conversation. How is this possible? Let me tell you about something called the wood wide web. <laughs> Underneath the forest floor, there is an entire mysterious world that we are just beginning to discover. The basis of this network is a symbiotic relationship between mycorrhizal fungi and the roots of trees. As author Robert McFarlane wrote for The New Yorker, the relationship between these mycorrhizal fungi and the plants they connect is now known to be ancient, around 450 million years old, and largely one of mutualism, a subset of symbiosis in which both organisms benefit from their association. Commonly, people associate fungi with infection, but in the forest, they provide connection. Uh, and what do these fungi look like? They are little white threads, smaller than the width of an eyelash. They extend in a vast, interconnected network that can go on for miles. Despite being tiny, they're actually hollow tubes. The fungi provide minerals that the tree needs to grow, such as phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, calcium, and copper. If trees didn't have minerals, they would never be more than a foot tall. The tree, in turn, shares from 20 to 80% of its sugars with the fungi. The fungi can't photosynthesize, which is why they set up the connection with the trees. This research gives us a whole new view of forests as a connected community rather than separate individuals. Trees share their carbon not only with the fungi, but with other trees of their own species and even with trees of other species. 
The older the tree, the more connected it is to others. One way that trees communicate is to warn other trees of an oncoming threat, such as insects or animals. For example, if a beetle starts munching on a leaf, the tree will send out a warning both through the air as well as the mycorrhizal web, prom prompting the other trees to produce a chemical that tastes bad to prevent the insects from eating them. Even more surprisingly, when a tree is dying, it will take all its carbon, its resources, its legacy, and move it from the roots to the mycorrhizal network into other trees. And not just any trees, specifically trees that are more adapted to withstand a warming climate. And although it's not clear yet who decides where the carbon goes, it does seem as if the trees are thinking ahead to the needs of the whole forest. As Suzanne Samard said in an interview, there's an intelligence there that's beyond just the species. Forests have a profound impact on climate change. Quoting a study conducted by the Nature Conservancy, the researchers found that trees have the greatest potential to cost-effectively reduce carbon emissions. This is because they absorb carbon dioxide as they grow, removing it from the atmosphere. The results of the study indicate that the three largest options for increasing the number and size of trees, reforestation, avoiding forest loss, and better forestry practices, could cost effectively remove 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide annually by 2030, equivalent to taking 1.5 billion gasoline burning cars off the roads. I take trees as my role models. <coughs> trees understand connection, and connection is vital to survival. This is what I want to leave you with. Nature can heal itself, but if we support nature, it can heal a lot faster. I believe there is intelligence in the forest, and perhaps there is even consciousness. If consciousness is defined as inward awareness of oneself experiencing reality, then it's hard to argue that plants are conscious. But, to quote Michael Pollan once again, if we define the term simply as the state of being awake and aware of one's environment, then plants may qualify as conscious beings. So in addition to the wood wide web, there are a number of other ecosystems and creatures in nature that have a similar level of complexity and planning that I too would require, or would argue require some level of consciousness. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about humpback whales and various species of shrimp because the ingenious of their systems can serve as a teacher to humans. Because we are not the only important species on the planet. There are so many systems out there that are so complex that we can only begin to understand. You may have heard stories about a dolphin or a monkey that can solve some sort of puzzle in a lab or listen to a command and so that makes it as intelligent as a three-year-old child. But today I want to step away from that type of thinking because I believe it is not quite right to measure an animal's intelligence by how similar they are to humans. To fully appreciate nature and understand it, I believe that we need to avoid trying to quantify it in human terms. So this is a humpback whale and her baby. These whales migrate 6,000 miles every year from the cold, nutrient-dense waters of Alaska in the summertime down to Hawaii in the winter where they raise their calves. And during their travels, the males sing. Scientists have been studying whale songs for over 50 years, and they still cannot pinpoint exactly why a whale sings. Because whales, the, the male whales sing during the breeding season, but it's unclear if the females have any preference over a singing male versus a quieter male versus this song versus that song. So it seems to pervade their entire lives rather than be one behavior for one specific task in their life. And what's also interesting is that certain songs spread through time and location, whale to whale. So this is a map of, or that's a map, this is a chart of whale songs spreading through time 
So as you can see, songs tend to move from East Australia to French Polynesia through time. They go out of fashion in East Australia just as they're going in fashion in French Polynesia. Sometimes there's little fads like in 1998 in Cook Islands in French Polynesia. And this um, sending of songs through space is called cultural transmission. And the patterns at play here reveal something so complex and deep that scientists are only just beginning to understand. This is krill. They are eaten by humpback whales. And just by looking at their magnificent swarm here, you can see that some method of mass communication is happening. Shrimp and a lot of other small creatures are a lot more intelligent and complex than we often give them credit for, such as Cynephilus regalis. These are social shrimp. They are no bigger than a grain of rice, but they live inside a sponge, much like ants or bees live inside a hive or a colony, because they have one queen, who's the progenitor, who lays all the eggs, and they have a lot of different other shrimps with specialized roles um, and specialized bodies to fit the roles, such as that guard shrimp with extra large claws with which it defends the sponge. This next shrimp is one of my favorite creatures on the planet. This is the pistol shrimp and his best friend, the goby fish. Um, the reason why they're so fascinating to me is because the pistol shrimp spends its days digging burrows in the sand. They can go as deep as one and a half meters into the ground and there's branches, chambers. Sometimes a number of shrimp and goby fish can live in the same burrow, but usually it's just a pair. And in exchange for this housing, the goby fish will provide protection to the pistol shrimp. So whenever the shrimp wants to leave the safety of the burrow, the goby fish will essentially hold the shrimp's hand by maintaining a constant antenna contact with the shrimp. And, oh, back one, <laughs> thank you. Um, so in the words of Johannes Duerbaum, who did a study on these creatures, at any slight disturbance of a predator, the goby signals to the shrimp's antenna in a highly ritualized way. The goby's dorsal or tail fin moves up and down or left to right in different frequencies, allowing the shrimp to withdraw should danger approach. There are also stories of a goby fish getting buried by a collapsing tunnel and waiting patiently as the shrimp goes to dig him out. And um, they also find food for each other. They eat different food, but if one finds food that the other one will like, they'll collect it. Again, according to Dwerbaum's work, in one instance, after collecting a piece of algae, the shrimp lost the algae due to currents in the tank. But the unexpected happened. The goby immediately took action and grabbed the algae with its mouth. That moment, the shrimp lost antenna contact with the fish and quickly rushed backward to the entrance. The goby transported the lost food back to the entrance, where it then gave it to the shrimp. The wonders of the humble shrimp can teach us that all animals and nature, plants, fungi, the wood wide web, they're all so beautiful, complex, important, and intelligent. Finally, to quote Lynn Margulis, we need a better understanding of global ecology. We need to be freed from our species-specific arrogance. No evidence exists that we are chosen, the unique species for which all others were made nor are we the most important because we are so numerous, powerful, and dangerous. Well, so in a similar theme, beaver is one animal that humans have shown our true capability to destroy, having decimated the species with our power and numbers. Beaver populations have dramatically decreased since hunting progressed throughout North America, which once held a population of over 60 million. A severe, severe hunting for their pelts, for their glands used as medicine and perfume, and most importantly, because of their perceived interference and damage to human land use. As their population dropped towards 6 million, wetlands were systematically drained and used for human purposes. We, on, we now only have 50% of the wetlands we once had on this North American continent and since, since the 19, 1700s. It is time for some preservation, restoration, conservation, and regulation. Beaver are remarkable as the creators of wetlands and as a keystone species. Give them access to a river, and they'll enlarge it, make the water bed deeper, 
aid in creating a system of wetlands that allows a habitat and ecosystem for numerous other fish, birds, and mammals. The dams and wetlands beaver create, create have an additional benefit, much improved water quality. Beaver have been considered a keystone species for good reason. The wetlands areas that beavers are so essential to creating are home to countless fish, birds, reptiles, and other mammals. The community and ecosystems that wetlands support are crucial to holding and keeping healthy water systems in drought and the purification of water. Beaver have often been considered pests by humans. Never has such a conception been more flawed. Many of our modern problems that have been caused by natural forces have been and can still be fixed by beaver, such as decreasing damaging floods, removing pollutants from surface and groundwater, drought protection, recharging drinking water aquifers, and decreased erosion. Another life form that creates many of the same solutions is facing a similar problem as the beaver, big blue stem. And now let me introduce to us a big problem all across the US. We have a turf grass problem. There is a widespread monoculture crop within most people's lives that completely evades notice for the destruction it causes, turf grasses. Monocultures possess an unusual ability to destroy diverse ecosystems, and turf grasses are no exception. The pesticides poured on them creates a poisonous habitat the shallow root system they possess cause poor water absorption, and the lack of nutrients they share and put back into the soil allow for no sharing of nutrients, such as in a healthy community of plants, including problems, creating problems for all species trying to live in them or even in the vicinity, including their human caretakers. It's a fragile system, unable to support itself. You have your typical turf grasses on your far left. Um, while the native grasses that existed here in New England, indeed all across the U.S., have much longer and substantial roots, as you can see. How can such short-rooted grasses as turf grasses survive? They can't, not without human intervention in the form of constant watering. And yet, um, when it rains in any significant amount, the plants can't absorb it. A grass such as the big blue stem not only has great deep roots that prevent soil erosion in places like Iowa, which is losing a great deal of topsoil every year due to winds blowing the barren, dusty ground into the Mississippi, but also a great water absorber and survivor and an excellent source of food for cattle. Here, and here is another example. You know, you can physically see the depth of some of these roots. Um, it's just enormous, and the turf grasses their roots are only so deep. It's just shocking. Um, here in this photo, um, the ground being measured once, once the level where the man on the right is sitting. Only the root roots of the big blue stem held the soil here in the middle of the Great Dust Bowl in Roosevelt County, New Mexico, 1957. Because the farmers here broke down the soil and removed the roots of the plants that were here, the wind took all the topsoil away. And in the words of Patrick Kircher, a Roosevelt County agriculture agent, now we know to leave the crop residue on the surface to help hold things in place. Um, I would like to end with a quote by Rachel Carson. Um, the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. And now I'm going to talk about another one of these wonderful communities. So how many of you had an apple for breakfast? Maybe an orange or some form of nut in a granola or something? Well, you can thank bees for that. Um, bees pollinate about 30% of the world's crops and have an incredibly large impact on almost 90% of the wild world's wild flowers and plants. Um, bees are also a very special species in that they have a unique way of communicating with each other. I'm sure many of you have seen images or videos of this, the little waggle dance that bees do to tell um, each other where to find food and where the best flowers grow. Bees also have an incredible organizational network. There are multiple different types of bee in a hive, queen bees, worker bees, nurse bees, that all have their own specific roles and purpose within the hive, be it food gathering or looking after the babies. However, this amazing community is under threat. Colony collapse disorder, um, CCD, is when the worker bees from the hive all disappear, leaving honey and queen, uh, the queen and some nurse bees behind. Um, and this essentially 
makes the hive, hive obsolete because there's no one to go out and collect food for all the rest of the bees left in the hive. Um, the number of hives in the U.S. has decreased dramatically since 2006 because of this. Um, scientists do not agree on much about CCD or um, the honeybee population in general. But one thing that they do agree on is that it is probably caused by a combination of factors. One thing that has been threatening the bee population for a long time is the Varroa mite, um, a parasite that latches onto the bee. The name, Varroa destructor, says it all. Uh, um, like I said before, this mite and other diseases have, have been around for a while, but historically, bees have been able to survive them. However, there has been an increase in other factors making it more difficult for the bees to survive. Um, climate change, uh, which causes changes in weather and temperature and rainfall, can make finding food and survival more difficult. If plants flower earlier, for example, due to a warming climate, bees will find it harder to gather all the nectar that they need. Um, pesticides, specifically neonicotinoids, weaken the ability of the bee to respond to these natural threats. These pesticides are systemic, which means they travel through the vascular system of the plant. Um, they can have both physiological effects on the formation of baby bees and also the communication of the bees. Um, however, through public policy, um, there has been a reduction in the level of neonicotinoids used, and it has shown um, that the decrease of bees has slowed. Um, research in 2007, um, showed that the decrease in the number of hives that have gone missing, and this is a very good sign. Now, I know that I, and I believe that Annie and Jamila and Linus as well, we're all frequently asked by friends and family how they can help, um, what they can do in their everyday lives um, to help. Um, so each of us decided to come up with a little action plan of something that you can do in your everyday life to help build a more biodiverse future, not just for humans, but for the entire planet. So my action plan is to reduce your consumption of products that are created in a way that uses pesticides. Uh, so my personal action plan is to get out into the forest around you more and just look around, see what's going on, because there's lots to see. And additionally, also seeking out companies that are doing things to support the environment. Uh, IKEA, for example, has made a commitment to sustainable forestry. And the North Face uh, recently started producing a hat using wool from sheep raised on a farm that takes in more carbon than it puts out. So seeking out these companies and supporting them are good things that you can do, little things that will make a big difference. I, for one, would encourage you to plant a diverse variety of native deep-rooted plants in your front yard. <clears throat> and my action plan is for humans to bring respect and wonder of nature into their daily lives, whether that means using and throwing away less plastic or buying less meat, dairy, and eggs, or um, using sustainably sourced clothing items or anything like that. Because if we think of ourselves as equals to the world around us, then we will take these measures as a given rather than an extra chore. And these are uh, little things that you can do and that we are all doing to help create the future that we want. Thank you. Thank you.